Dobre večer. Dobrodošli. Um, good evening and welcome. On behalf of the Belgrade Center for Digital Humanities, I'd like to welcome you all um, and thank you for being here. Uh, when we were planning this event, I knew it was completely insane to start with a public lecture on a Sunday evening. And uh, you've, you've helped to make that into a um, pleasant experience. I'm glad to see that we do have an audience today. So um, we are here to um, officially open the Daria Teach Open Humanities Workshop, which will actually take place tomorrow. Daria Teach is a project um, that seven European universities and research centers are involved with. Um, we got a grant through an Erasmus Plus strategic partnership scheme to work on a platform um, for teaching materials for digital humanities. And uh, we are organizing this workshop tomorrow. We brought um, members of the Daria Teach team, but also some experts from outside to inspire us and to challenge us, to make sure that we're on the right track and to see how we can possibly cooperate with other projects and improve our platform. Uh, most of us who are involved in this project are digital humanists. We are researchers, we're teachers, but we are not experts in educational technology. This is not what we, I mean, we use technology in our work and in our teaching, but we wanted to also make sure that we have somebody who is a real expert in this field. And I'm thrilled that we got Tony Hall to be here with us tonight. Um, Tony is from the National University of Ireland at Galway. I've heard him speak uh, before. He's a very engaging and wonderful speaker, and I'm, I'm really happy that he could join us today. So, um, yes. Um, I welcome Tony again, and let's give it up for him. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you, Susan, as well, for the invitation to speak this evening. As Thomas said, Sunday evening um, at 6 o'clock, you probably have better places to be. <laughs> but it just shows a commitment and engagement with, with research in the humanities and digital humanities to have um, a crowd here this evening to, uh, to look at, at the concept of design in, in education and design-based research. So some of my own background, I'm a lecturer in educational technology at the National University of Ireland in Galway. And um, I also am a design-based researcher. So I'm very interested in ideas of design and how we actually create technologies as well as use them. So we're all very used to, forgive the pun, using technology in our lives. Um, we buy technologies and use them very widely in different things we do. But uh, a prevailing view now is that we need to consider in, in more effectively maybe using technology to consider the notion of design. So how is it that we make technology usable and useful for people and learners, uh, be they in schools, at third level, uh, adult and further education, early childhood, all, all the different areas where education happens. So for this evening, um, again, thank you very much for the invitation to speak this evening. Um, we're going to look at design-based research. Again, it's just one of many different types of educational research um, that we have available to us today, and it's very popular, and it's widely used in contemporary educational research, particularly a propos in, in, in respect of designing using technology. It doesn't always necessarily have to involve technology, design research or design-based research, but ordinarily it does involve technology, be that, be that a MOOC, a mobile phone, an iPad, um, ubiquitous technology, where maybe the, uh, we'll talk a little bit about a project that was involved a number of years ago, um, where we embedded technology in the environment to actually try and create learning and engagement. Also, just contemporary awareness of, of, of development, sorry, an awareness of contemporary developments in educational research, particularly met methodological issues in respect of educational change, innovation, and technology. And I suppose tonight, again, I know I'm here lecturing, as it were, so, but I hope that this is a dialogue, and also when we have the reception afterwards, that we can talk about technology and how we use it in learning and teaching. Um, so please feel free to interject if you have an idea or a question and you want to, to discuss that. Um, I'd, I'd like, to, like you to, to invite you to do that. But also as a context DBR for thinking critically about your research methodology and questions. So if we think about design, and design is a very fortuitous thing in some ways. Uh, you know, often a design flaw or an add-on can 
become actually a very popular technology. If you think of SMS, it was originally intended as just, it was just something there that was there in the mix of when we initially started to communicate with technological devices like phones. SMS was an add-on, but it actually, as we know, became a very, very popular medium of, tech, of communication through mobile technology. Um, but particularly su successful innovations with technology, more often than not, I would say, are created in a bespoke fashion for users. They are designed to be easy to use, uh, usable uh, being the term we'd, we'd use there. And I suppose technology and our expectations of it have increased and what it can do for us considerably, we'll say in the last 20 years. Technology is pervasive, it's ubiquitous. And what we expect technology to be able to do for it to be easy to use, etc. And it's ubiquitous in our culture, our economy and society. So if we think about design, um, this is a an image, uh, Don Norman, who's one of the leading people on, on design and technology, you can see there's probably a usability. It's a very nice artifact, but there's probably a little bit of a usability issue with this uh, particular um, item, uh, particularly if it's serving hot drinks. Um, so again, we, we think about usability there, but so the preeminence of use or usefulness, the things are useful, that we can use them, and uh, they're actually useful to us. There's a utility uh, to, to the, the object or the artifact. Artifact, And it's actually one of the most popular talks on education online is Ken Robinson, formerly the professor of creative kind of education at the University of uh, Warwick, I think. But he, his talk is like over 10 million views on YouTube. But um, he talks about aesthetic, the aesthetic in learning, engaging the senses. We have five senses, I think, when I last looked anywhere, I counted. Uh, we have five senses, and engaging the senses is so important in learning. And it was actually an educationist in the 18th century, a Swiss educationist called Johann Pestalozzi, who first coined the three H's in learning. Heads on, hearts on, and hands on. So when learning is at its fully realized, most interactive uh, manifestation, we're, we're engaged, our heart, we're, in, we're actually feel or we emote in some meaningful way. We think intellectually, obviously, or cognitively, and we're doing something. We're actually making something. And that's at the heart of good design and learning with technology today. We've actually recently in Ireland had the publication of our digital strategy for schools. And for the first time, the prevailing philosophy within that is this building or doing approach to technology where you construct, or what we call constructionism, or constructivism with technology. So we're using it and we're active in the use of the technology to make and build meaningful artifacts. Also, the, the notion of designing for emotion and experience, designing technology that it doesn't have to be difficult to use, of course, as we say, said earlier, but also that it in some way engages us um, in a way that r relates to our experience as people. Um, and new technologies are there uh, very much in, uh, as a central part of, of design and design research as well. And cooperative evaluation, and what we mean by that is that the user is ver very involved in the development and design of the technology and its implementation. So perhaps historically in the early years with, with particularly digital technology, the degree to which you, the learner or the user were involved in the actual development, you know, the, we've, we've had perhaps in most countries some kind of a scheme to implement or deploy mobile or some form of technology, but without actually engaging with teachers or with, or with uh, lecturers or with students about what they would want, what will actually make their learning experience uh, more engaging, more interactive, and hopefully more effective. So when we design for education, we're, we're faced with, I suppose to set the, a broad context, we're si faced with situational and technological complexity um, in that, you know, learning um, and how it happens still, we're still really learning, um, forgive the pun again, um, we're still actually learning about learning and what, how actually learning happens. So we know a lot about outer space, but the, the private world of inner space is still a very important area of research in psychology and other disciplines. We actually, for, 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 the, for a large part, ha are still finding out the key questions around learning and what learning is and how it becomes manifest. And educational innovation in that context is complex. So what you're trying to do in your project and in your research is a complex endeavor. Um, we're faced with a, maybe a bewildering at times array of technologies. What's going to be the most effective? And we have ver pro perhaps some one of the most exciting, I've used a couple of them myself and I've found them very beneficial are MOOCs, and I know we're going to talk about them tomorrow in the workshop as well. But there's very little research around their impact with learners, you know, how actually are they impacting upon the learner experience. It's still quite limited. And even the, the data around the number of people, I think it was something like of, of the 100% of people who engage with MOOCs or use them, it's only something like 5% finish them. 
So again, we, we're used to trying technologies, and if they work, great, and sometimes perhaps if they don't. So there's a scale issue there around how we can actually analyze and understand that, that, that phenomenon in education. Reed Stevens at the University of Washington has a very nice quote on this a number of years back, and he says that the sophistication of technology in the new and hybrid practices uh, they make possible that it far outpaces the sophistication of our analysis. So actually, we're trying to catch up. We're trying to understand something that's moving a, pa moving a pace from us, that's actually moving very, very fast and changing very, very, uh, very not so much even incrementally, but really perhaps revolution in a revolutionary sense. Um, I think about the Finnish um, educator here and educational kind of philosopher maybe, or uh, researcher, famous book, Finnish Lessons, Pazzi Salaberg, and he talks about the three T's. And I suppose some of the questions we have to ask ourselves when we, when we look at technology and education, uh, and when we look at change or using some form of an innovation in learning and teaching, are th the three t t T's, and particularly talent, is our notion of talent in education, how we measure it in school and in university and in other contexts, educational contexts, is it nuanced, is it inclusive or complex enough how we actually um, address that, that concept? And, and ma many people, sadly, are, you know, the, the cr critique of school would be that we have a very narrow measurement of what educational achievement might be. Um, and that doesn't reflect, for many people, um, their talent. And, and, and we need a more nuanced, complex, inclusive understanding of that. Secondly, do we have the time in, in our lives? Um, you've given the time this evening here on a, on a Sunday night to be here. Um, I see everyone's still listening, so that's great. It's always a boon and a, and a bonus. Um, so we need to be explorative and innovative and creative, but do we have the time in our schools and in our jobs and our roles every day to actually be innovative, to sustain an innovation over time? And then technology, do we exploit it optimally? Do we actually make the most of, of digital media and technology uh, in education? So these are some of the challenges we face. So you can see, hopefully, that the, the, the landscape is quite a, uh, you know, it's quite actually unapprehensible in some ways. It's, we're, we're still making the road here as we walk around technology and what learning is and what education is. So with that in mind, um, design research, and it's, again, it's been around since Herb, Herbert Simon and others earlier, but the seminal work was in 1992, Anne Brown's paper on what you call design experiments. And she said, look, this learning and education and technology are complex things, and we need to be able to experiment, to try things out, and to try to do that systematically. Um, and when we ask that question then, um, you know, do, do, how do we innovate to improve educational outcomes for all? How do we do that? How do we do that most effectively? Is there a role for technology in affecting this change? And what does that role look like? And we've had, I, I teach, one of the subjects I teach uh, is the philosophy of education. And the first curricula in education are very ancient now. Aristotle and Plato and Socrates, the big three in Athens. Um, it was Plato and Aristotle who first kind of scoped out, or amongst the first to write about what education, certainly in the Western context, uh, what that might be. Um, and, and some of the things they're saying to us, they said to us back then, we're still trying to do today. We're still trying to create curricula in schools, innovation in schools, which reflect that broader con conception of talent that, that Pazzi Salaberg talks about. Um, and still we have this perhaps disconnect between the theory of what good learning and what effective learning, what inclusive learning is, uh, and what happens practically in the classroom and in educational environments. So with that, we need some kind of an, an approach that's empirical, that's grounded in practice. So again, as we'll see with design research, it is a very practical approach to change and trying to use technology more effectively in learning. But at the same time, it tries to be uh, theoretical and, and informed in that way. So what's the added value of technology then in learning? And that's the question you're going to ask yourself any time you try a technology. As I was formerly a secondary school teacher. And you, you, know, you would use technology in different classes with different groups, uh, with different lessons, for different, uh, ob with the different objectives. And you ask yourself that question, what's the value added here of the technology? Is it, am I spending 25 minutes setting up this technology before class, and then does it have the impact in my lesson that I wanted it to have? Um, so we, we ask ourselves these questions all the time around, what is actually the, uh, the benefit, the, the effect, the impact of the technology? And we're aware, all of us, that there's a very significant hyperbole and hype around technology uh, in our world today as well and what, what it might do for us. So there's the imperative for practical research that's informed by theory. And also, are our theories of education and the humanities sufficiently complex 
for the contemporary world as well. So how we think about the, the humanities, how you think about, you know, it, what, it, what does it mean to be a digital humanist? What does that mean? What do, what do the arts mean? If you even look at this rumor in here this evening, you look at the paintings on the wall, there's a multimediality, there's a mediality about those, those paintings, a creativity uh, that we could analyze probably um, for the rest of the, of the workshop, just even one of those paintings, you know, and we can have a very interesting discussion on that. So actually our understanding of, of what it means to educate today and what, what the humanities mean today are changing as well. <coughs> So, and, and that's, again, of course, mobilized by uh, changes in technology and innovations in technology. So when we think about design and technology and education, and again, I, I underscore that word design and the D. It's design with a capital D. It's really trying to think about here's a technology or here's an idea for a piece of technology if you have the, the money and the time to develop a new intellectual property, a new technology. What do you really want it to do? What, what do you really want uh, it to, to, uh, to, to achieve for your learners? But what's your unit of analysis? Is it the individual learner? Is it groups? Is it a, a, a particular class? Is it a particular um, a part of, of the humanities curriculum? Is it a, what's your particular focus? What do you, what do you actually, what's your unit of analysis? And that could scale. There's some very interesting microethnographic research that looks at even 20 seconds of interaction with a piece of technology. You know, and the, you can see so much this already even going on with 20 seconds of how someone might use a piece of technology can be, can be very interesting and insightful. The other notion is that educational research and research perhaps, perhaps in general, not just in educational research, is becoming extremely specialized. So is there a way to draw together different perspectives, to synthesize those, to bring them together, to maybe offer new perspectives? And that's a very fascinating aspect, I think, of the digital humanities is this possibility and potential with technology and the humanities and, and what that means today and the synergy or the sim synthesis of the two and what they, how they might remake each other, what kind of new realities, new perspectives, new questions, new understandings do they enable. And I think when you think about design research and the learning sciences as a, an, a cognate field, some of the areas that come up are psychology, computer science, neuroscience as well, how the brain works, how the interior learning processes happen, as well as what happens collaboratively, socially amongst us as we learn from each other and learn together. But some key questions remain very under-researched in education. How does learning and, and, and education happen across time? Um, you know, our understanding of how learning happens across time for the individual, the connection between informal and formal learning as well. These are areas that are still very under-researched. So some of the challenges that education is very situated, you'll know that as a teacher, as an educator in your own respective context. Um, it's context dependent and sensitive. How well do educational theories translate to and directly inform practice? We, we have a conception, understanding, as I said, it goes back to the Greeks even. Um, if you read Aristotle and, you, and Plato's Republic, you have the first discussion of what, what education should be. Um, and this, it, some of those ideas we're still implementing or trying to implement maybe today. Um, is research that is undertaken in a highly specific or specialized context generalizable to other settings? So the work you do in your project, uh, outcome, the outcomes from this workshop and from what you produce and develop in this project, how generalizable will that be to other cognate and, and re related contexts as well? Um, so these are important questions for technology design. There are different actors and factors that influence the design of innovation, educational technology, and those outcomes that emerge or that come from that. And education and learning are complex and emergent processes as well. John Dewey, one of the great educationists, and I often think one's probably my favorite quote about education, Dewey would say that education isn't a preparation for life, education is life itself. So how do you design for something that's not predictable, perhaps, that's very personal, that's constructed as you experience your life and as you, that life unfolds over time, uh, drawing on, on your past and moving to your present and trying to live mindfully. In the, 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 a lot of, there's a lot of research, I'm sure we're all aware of the mindful research at the moment about being mindful in the present. Um, so this education is a very interesting com, uh, phenomenon. And then a single theory or theorization of learning, it may not be uh, sufficient to give the broad kinds of insights. So, I like this quote as well. I mentioned Dewey there, and this comes from Chris Hoadley, who's one of the, kind of, was one of the found, founders of design research as well, one of the leaders in, in the area. And he talks about, 
He says, the conjugation of problematic and determinate characters in nature, it renders every existence as well as every idea in human act an experiment in fact, even though not in design. So even if we design, and you'll know that from lessons you've designed or curricula or technologies that you've worked with, you'll have designed a lesson or you've thought about how it's going to be, how it's going to be delivered and taught in the classroom or in the lecture hall or in a particular educational context, and it doesn't unfold perhaps quite as you, you, you envisaged. Uh, to be intelligently experimental is but to be conscious of this intersection uh, of natural conditions, so as to profit by it instead of being at its mercy. So I think that notion that what you're trying to do with the humanities, because you know, we look back at Shakespeare, we look back at the classics, I mentioned Aristotle, the big three in Athens, look at any philosopher or writer, uh, their work is still being interpreted, still being understood and, 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 and read, and read in different ways and in new ways with new nuances. So in the same way, in learning and teaching, it's this notion of intelligent experimentation. So the, in design research, we try to integrate practice and theory. I say try, because these are, any of us that have theorized, we're all researchers. <laughs> we, we know well the theories, we, we, and what we try to do is make them manifest in the practical things we do in our research. How well that synthesis happens uh, is, is really the challenge for us, you know. Um, and um, it is very important that the two, I think it was Ian Lister at the University of Leeds says that practice without theory is, is uh, blind, but equally theory without practice is sterile. So the need for both, the, the mutual kind of um, augmentation of both. And then a broader conceptualization of learning problems and questions. And we call this in design research our multi-ontological framework. So that notion earlier that things that happen in learning and teaching, particularly now as we deal with the modern world and how fast, how fast paced that is, technology, how fast that changes, that we need to draw on different theories. Relying on just one view of learning or teaching um, isn't perhaps um, sufficient. Uh, and in design research, what we often do is we take ideas from different theorists which help us then to, to understand and to conceptualize the, the problem or the phenomenon that we're studying, that unit of analysis, as, as, as I said earlier. And then we also have this view of learning that there are multiple dependent variables. So there isn't just one variable. We aren't just looking at motivation or engagement or looking at storytelling with technology and learning, perhaps. Or you're looking at many different aspects of the learning experience for, for the learner and the teacher. So as I've shown an example presently, um, that can mean a, a broad set of things. Um, and I'll, I'll perhaps um, we'll, we'll look at some of the more specific, which tend to transcend uh, learning and teaching broadly. And then also, you're trying to allow, allow for, for learning to unfold in a natural, constructive way, uh, where perhaps um, something new is being tried out. And I'm, you're really at the front in digital humanities of, of the new and the old, if, if that's, I hope that's not a false dichotomy, but you're dealing with you know, classics, um, with text, with something, or past, uh, as Yeats, just quote a famous Irish poet, again, of course, it's a very significant year, it's the centenary of Yeats in Ireland this year, but... He has that famous quote, and he talks about the dead. They still speak to us. They may not appreciate that, but, but, but they, there's still all these t tensions and energies being released from the past into our present today. Um, and we will see that particularly in the next number of years uh, in, in, in Europe and in, in, in Ireland as well. Um, so allowing for the constructive, that emergent notion of learning. And then supporting researchers to deal with and exploit the emergent nature of learning innovation and technology as well. So the technologies we use are very, again, we're, 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 we're still at the, in the early stages of what we might call the information age or the digital age, um, how all these terms that we use for, for the kind of contemporary context with technology. And one of the things that design research, which I like about it is, I like theory um, as a researcher, I suppose, as a, uh, someone in academia, you, you do like theory and you like to think and talk about issues and topics that are important, but equally, you want practical things that people can use. So the idea of design research is to produce models and theories and tools and uh, guidelines. Uh, we wouldn't say any more, probably, we wouldn't say uh, user requirements so much, because they're seen, I can see people <laughs> uh, smiling, <laughs> ruefully, no. Uh, but user requirements are difficult because requiring every user to use the technology in exactly the same way might that, that might be too limiting, I think. I'm actually, I've, I'm just putting that question to you. <laughs> I'm not uh, prescribing any, I'm not saying that's your user requirement. 
Uh, but user requirements, we, we talk about colleagues of mine, Liam Bannon and Luigina Chalfi, coined the term design sensitivities. This notion of uh, being sensitive to different types of use and scenarios of use, rather than a prescriptive set of guidelines, perhaps. Because it doesn't perhaps work like that, how people use technology. And you hope that these models and these approaches are useful to a wider community of researchers, teachers, educators. Um, and that's, what design, that's, I suppose, why it appealed to me when I first encountered design research back in 2002 at the Learning Sciences Conference in Seattle, was th this idea of, 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 of a usable outcome from these, these, this research. And a key word in, the, in design research is the notion of being tra trying to be transitive. You're trying to change. You're trying to um, you know, be the, uh, the um, irresistible force uh, for that immovable object <laughs> of learning. You're trying to change the context and the learning experience. So um, in my own view, it, design research, it just demonstrates the potential of an innovation or a technology. There's a lot of hype about technology, but what the technology might help us to do, what they enable us to do. So it perhaps helps us to demonstrate the potential. It articulates, hopefully, having demonstrated the potential, as you'll see, there's a, a way of doing design research which I'd recommend, because we too often, perhaps, we take monolithic systems or technologies that are already developed by, other, by engineers and others, and they're very well, very, very well developed, but how well they transpose or they adapt across to our own User, user, user requirements or user context may not be uh, entirely uh, straightforward or, um, or actually uh, possible. So it articulates then in detail how an innovation or technology can be used to enhance learning. That's part of uh, design research. I supervise a uh, number of design uh, PhD re research in this area, and the theses tend to be quite substantive because you're trying to tell the story. This is the technology we used. This is how we try to develop it and, and pilot it. And, and then you try to tell as, as rich a story as you can. So the narrative of the use of the technology is extremely important, the story of the actual user experience with the technology. And then you try to have a, a design model or a framework that others can use. So you're still trying to provide some user requirements. You're not saying there aren't any principles or, or criteria for, for the, the effective use of this technology. You're still trying to provide that. But at the same time, you're trying to do it in a way that you're saying, look, this is, my, this is what worked for me in my context, and uh, uh, I hope it, it'll, it'll be adaptable and adoptable for you. So in the demonstration part, are you looking at the piloting of a technology? And this is why I would recommend, if you can, is to pilot the technology initially. Um, you know, test it with users. Try to see how well it will work, how effectively it works. Again, it's a common sense approach in many respects. But it's very important because... We're told, you know, we've been told um, by technologists and others that technology, and it is, it does enable us to do things we never could do before. Um, if you think about open educational resources particularly, um, that you can, you know, I did a, a MOOC there last year on Shakespeare, uh, and it was fantastic. You know, I, a couple of hours a week, I did a small little module, and I did a, a quiz, and at the end, I had learned quite a lot, and it was very useful. Again, you'd, you'd, it'd beckon the kind of question do I need to be in a classroom as well? You know, it changes the way we think about education and teaching as well. But the innovation of the technology may not be necessarily proven. Um, so early on, you try to have to prototype and have some smaller scale intervention to explore the potential of the approach. And then what you try to do is you expand the scope. And that could be literally using um, the technology with a bigger set of, uh, big, a, a greater numbers of learners or over an extended period of time. And you try to actually show um, how, how the innovation or technology can impact over time on, on, a, on a greater number of learners or, a, or, or along a, um, a longer time, timeline. And then also you could try to contribute to understanding of how educational innovation or technology can be designed, deployed, and evaluated on a more longitudinal basis. And this is something we really need, is to try and understand over time how technology is impacting. There was a book written back in 1998, I think, by Gene Rochlin at Princeton, um, Trapped in the Net, and it was a very interesting book about the internet and how complex it was. And you think that was how many years ago? We're nearly 20 years later. And how complex and... Uh, you know, multifarious technology is. Um, so the il illustrates then also the ex you kind of ex finesse and validate by the final design. So what I'm getting at here are three, at least three design cycles, if that's possible. A lot of funded work and research, you mightn't have that kind of window of time. 
It might be 18 months. It might be 12 months. <laughs> I can see people nodding. It might be three years. But again, for technology research, it probably asks that question about the need for longer term funding around these kinds of, that you know, we can look at over a longer period of time, the efficacy or the impact of the technology with learners. And typically at the end, when you illustrate the approach overall, usually in the, what, we call, what I call the capstone intervention or the capstone deployment, you're, you're trying to get towards this notion of a, a set of sensitivities, a model that others can use. And usually these are bespoke. So these are usually very specific criteria for that domain or that area of learning. So if it's the digital humanities, your design, your set of guidelines or user requirements should be very bespoke. They should be quite specific, really, under different um, categories of, of um, uh, as much as you can taxonomize a, cat a set of categories for, for the learning inter intervention. So the prototype design model, model you usually start with that in, in your approach. So that would be your original research questions, the, a literature review, your biographical motivation, and then also drawing on theory. And the prototype design model, um, and some people, and Chris Hoadley, one of the leading researchers in design-based research, would say, we never actually move but beyond that, probably, that when we design, it's always a formative process. We never have a finished design of the technology, that it's, we can only take it so far in some respects. This, it's so true of curriculum innovation. We have significant innovation in Ireland at the moment in our curriculum. And it's interesting that the stakeholders involved and at what stage that actually is at and how, 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 how that will man, become fully manifest over time. So the why, the, why, are, we, why are you uh, conceptualizing this approach to technology? And then your design model will have normally two parts to it. The what, so the sensitivities. What, what, are you, what are the things that one wants to achieve with this technology and who needs to be in, involved in the design process? Um, and then what you do is you, you, you explore the how, I suppose, if we're to break it down into those kinds of key interrogatives. You, through the design cycles, you, you arrive then at a systematic, hopefully theoretically oriented trial and error of, of the approach. So a typical DBR structure is you pilot the technology which demonstrates the potential of the design. But the other thing that's really formative when you design technology, and it comes back to what Reed Stevens, when I quoted him earlier, um, is our analysis, actually, we're, we're, we're also prototyping our evaluation. You're not only prototyping, you're actually trying to, you're prototyping your own understanding of what the technology is, is doing. And that's very important, that actually the rubrics you might use, the set of requirements, the way that you evaluate with users, that's actually taking shape as well. So the actual way that you evaluate at all the technology and its impact, that's also at a formative stage um, in the early pilot. And then what we try to do is to mainstream, and this is where we try to, to, to an extent, and I use this cautiously, to prove the impact of the technology, to actually show its impact, uh, illustrating how the design can be enhanced and improved over time. You sometimes see design studies where it improves in the mainstream, and then in the capstone it might disimprove slightly, or it might, there might be contra more contradictory data around the user experience. So again, it just shows that our, we're always prototyping, we're always in this kind of process of becoming in terms of our use and understanding a technology. And then the capstone usually is to prove or to show, illustrate, and articulate a model for how the technology can be used. So again, if we're to conceptualize it, it's simply it's a pilot, starting with a pilot of the technology, some kind of a mainstreaming of it then, and a capstone intervention, which hopefully will will validate or verify to an extent the process overall and the emerging design of technology. So this is just some recent work I completed with a colleague of mine who undertook her PhD with me, Bonnie Long. Um, and this was our design based on one of the leading theorists in the area, Susan McKenney and Tom Reeves' work. So they talk about this integrative model of design. And you can see it's this dynamic kind of process, dynamical process. So this is our adaptation of their work based on, on the, the work that, that Bonnie uh, and myself did. So it was over three, three design cycles in six years the technology was implemented. So we, what we were exploring was digital storytelling with pre-service teachers. So we were looking at the impact with them over, over an extended period of time. And what's interesting in the McKenney and Reeves model is they talk about a number of outcomes from our design when we design and use technology, proximal and distal. So the proximal are the local outputs. That's where you actually show the local efficacy of the technology design. And that can also be uh, made manifest or evident in the projects that your students create. 
So if they create really good work with the technology, that's, uh, that's, a, very, that's a verifiable outcome and a, an exemplification of the effectiveness of the design. And then the distal is your theoretical kind of outcome. Bonnie and I would submit that you can add probably a medial contribution there. So things like timetables, curricula, designs like that, scheduling of the use of the technology, when should you use it and what, at what time in the curriculum, uh, what module should, should be first, uh, should you uh, scaffold the use of the technology, should there be some inductionary introduction to the technology, etc. So um, if anyone's interested, we have a paper just published with Susan McKenney in a special issue coming out soon, and I can share that with anyone here this evening, uh, which really articulates the, the design and how we try to, to, to look at this, this notion of digital storytelling with, with pre-service teachers. Uh, happy enough to say, well, our data showed that there, were, uh, there was very convincing data from students and from the other ways that we triangulated um, the feedback and, and, and evaluation of the research that they were very happy overall with digital storytelling as a way of helping them to reflect on their, their practice as teachers, as, as early stage, early career teachers. So some of the caveats around design research, I hope that kind of gives somewhat of an overview. Um, just going to check the time here, folks, so we're, uh, I don't want to encroach on the reception. That's the, probably the most important thing this evening. <laughs> um, sorry, so, um, uh, the, so the, really you, you will have quite rich data in, uh, when, when you undertake this type of research. It's, it's probably one of the more difficult things is to actually navigate that. What kind of data do you gather? Um, is it, it's user logs or it's your, your, you might do a thinking aloud, which is where you get the user to enunciate what they're doing as they work, through the, work with the technology and you video record it. You might do focus groups, observational studies. You can gather quite a slew of data. And it's, again, how you, you parse and sift that data. What's meaningful? and trying to find out how users um, have felt about the technology and its use. Um, and as I said earlier, the design, the final design, isn't ever really the finished um, design. It's always going to be adaptable. And that has to be the case, because if you take a classroom here in Belgrade and you have a, a classroom in Ireland or a classroom in London or the States or wherever, um, th they'll be very different, a different curriculum, different um, students, different um, uh, technology, perhaps. So, you're, you're always uh, you know, trying to um, adapt and tweak and finesse the model for the given context of learning. Um, but it does establish the potential. Um, as I found in, in my research, it can help really to establish the potential of, a pro of an approach to technology and how it might be deployed to enhance learning and education. So usually what we do is we have recursive intervention cycles. As I said, usually three if you can. You're, you're again, funded research often if it's it might, you might have three years to do um, the, the work that Bonnie Thompson Long did with me in the last se is in its sixth, seventh year of, re of research um, with you know hundreds of, of pre-service teachers looking at what Bo the evaluation that Bonnie undertook. You know, was very detailed every day, looking at their experience with the technology, um, trying to understand how that the impact of that technology for their learning. Um, also, we, we will. Uh, we'll, we usually will produce a multi-ontological framework, so where we draw together different um, theories. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that presently. And a responsiveness to the emergent experimental nature of things, as Dewey said earlier, that we make the road by walking. We're actually in education. Um, you know, I, I remember my experience as a teacher. I would have one lesson, teach it one day with one group, and it went fantastically well with another group. There were a different set of challenges. There was half the class were gone on a field trip or gone to a sports activity. Um, it totally changed the dynamic of the class if I wanted to do group work or something like that. So again, the kind of emergent, um, adaptable need for flexibility in our methods. But it can produce exemplar processes, interventions, and models and products. And as I said, if you read a design study, they can often be very uh, weighty tomes, you know. <laughs> Uh, quite extensive uh, documents, but they need to be to document what happened with the technology, how it was used, its impact and efficacy with learners. And also the frameworks for design, analysis and evaluation. So how it is we evaluate? What rubrics do we use? How do we take maybe a rubric that already is pre-validated and adapted for our own context? Um, or a set of user requirements and, and uh, you know, analyzing and look at our own learning um, intervention or technology uh, in, 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 in relation to that. So I'm going to, we'll, we'll talk a little bit in a moment about a, a, another project that I was involved with for my PhD, which was looking at 
ubiquitous computing in, in, I suppose, humanities education, the sense of museums, and uh, just as an exemplar to finish with. But if we work back, the three kind of, you know, if we work back, the three outputs of design-based research is this kind of ternary of contribution. So it can help us to produce models that others can use, resources, tools, frameworks, and the like, uh, rubrics, evaluation schema, etc. It also helps, as I said, to illustrate. So where design st a design study is done over time and done quite well or quite robustly and quite um, you know, uh, rigorously in terms of the data collection and analysis over time, it can really help us to see the impact of a technology over time with a group of learners. And that's very important because we're still, we're still in the early years of using technology in education. And in some contexts, in some classrooms, there, you know, there's very limited use of technology, if any. Um, and our curriculum, again, it comes back to what Pazzi Salaberg was saying about our understanding of, we're, we're in our, the Irish context, we're, we're just starting to look at digital assessment as part and formative assessment in our own context. So that'll hopefully um, create new impetus for technology as well. Um, and proof of concept as well. So just proving, just showing that a technology can, this notion of digital humanities, what does that mean? What does it mean to be a digital humanist and a digital educator in the humanities? What does that even or your experience, you're at the, the, the forefront of this. You're in the frontier of, of this idea of what the digital hum humanities is. What does it mean to teach um, the humanities and, and to do so digitally? Um, and how best do we do that? Um, this is a really nice quote from Christine Stephen and Lydia Plowman uh, from a number of years back. And they talk about, I think it really kind of focuses on some of the concepts we want to try and aspire to and achieve in education and the opportunity, the technology, and, but more importantly, perhaps, a reconceptualization of learning. So the, the rethinking of what learning might be and what that might look like with technology. Um, and it's not easy to, to, to design that, particularly whereas Ken Robinson, I mentioned him earlier in his talk, on te, in the TED Talk, he talks about this very kind of industrial model of education that's kind of deep in the DNA. And why is it we, we have, since Aristotle, since... Since the Greeks, we have kind of an idea of what education should look like, and we have had so many innovative models of teaching through Montessori, Pestalozzi, uh, Frenet, other, other great uh, educational innovators uh, and thinkers. We've had so many different models of education uh, and teaching. Um, and why is it that you know, we still, in some, some contexts, at some levels, particularly secondary level maybe, we have a very uh, industrial view of learning? Um, or that can be the prevailing model, as Ken Robinson would say. Um, and they say that Christine Stephen and Lydia Plowman, uh, quoting Larry Cuban's famous book, Oversold and Underused Computers in the Classroom, where he said that computers are kind of a, and technology was a benign addition. He felt it was just there and did it really add value to learning and teaching. Um, he, he said it was kind of an innocuous type of intervention, as it were, that it's just benign addition to learning and teaching in classrooms. And they said that we can probably go further than that if we find new ways of conceptualize conceptualizing ICT so that the term does not simply denote the standard ideas of technology. I think, you know, when, when people like um, Doug Engelbart and others develop the mouse and that way of interacting with technology is a brilliant, transformative, revolutionary way of using technology. But we, have, we can think about it differently now. We've, we've mobile devices and, and so forth, which change how we can design learning and teaching as well. Um, and that you know, that this may lead us to new ways of thinking about technology that focus on things like discovery, delight, curiosity, creativity, self-expression, and pleasure in learning. So it's thinking about how can you, in the, the technologies you use in the digital humanities and digital humanities education and research, perhaps can conceptualize a way of learning and teaching with technology that promotes these types of things. So I just want to give an example, again, which intersects and... Uh, with, with, particularly with the humanities, because it was situated in a museum context in the Hunt Museum in Limerick in Ireland. And it was a design, it was a European project, framework uh, six project called SHAPE. And we worked at the Hunt Museum. Um, the Hunt Museum is very unique in the context of Limerick, where I'm originally from. I live and work in Galway. Um, it's a very um, cosmopolitan, very incredible collection to have anywhere in the world. It's very diverse. It's collected by John and Gertrude Hunt, his wife, and uh, this is their home, and this is kind of apropos because they, they would actually display objects in their home. So they didn't believe in museum objects being kind of sequestered away from people. They would make them publicly available in their house. So 
Again, um, I have a replica Picasso. It's not an original in my kitchen. Um, I'm, again, but this is, a, you know, it's, in many ways, it's a very radical, very innovative way of thinking about how we engage with the past and, and that. But our multi-ontological framework then for this project, or for my own research within the project, was I was inter we were interested in the material pro property of objects. So material um, interaction, physical interaction. I said earlier, I mentioned Johann Pestalozzi, incredible educator who was informed, of course, by the great French thinker who wrote the famous book, Emile Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and his notions about natural learning and learning from the environment. Uh, but Pestalozzi talked about hands-on. So we were very interested to develop a, 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 an exhibit or an, in, uh, an interaction with technology in the past where you would, it would be very hands-on and inter, where you'd interact with artifacts. So a criticism of technology maybe in museums, for example, is that they separate us from the past. So rather than, you know, you're looking at a screen or you're interacting with a touch screen, or if you have an audio guide, now I've seen brilliantly designed audio guides as well, which are fantastically designed. The storytelling and everything is wonderfully designed. But sometimes, perhaps, they, they create a, another barrier between us and the material rem, you know, rem, reminiscence of the past or remnants of the past. Narrative and storytelling was a big part of, of what we were looking at as well. And I would say that in any design of technology, I would go as far as to say that this will have to be a key area for you to look at. <laughs> I'd nearly go as far as to say that <laughs> quite strongly, that storytelling is, is such a, an incredibly important aspect, aspect of learning um, and narrative. And that narrative design it can inspire us. Uh, science fiction has, has inspired so many different devices and technologies. And equally, the way we think about a news technology inspires um, science fiction as well. But storytelling and narrative are very important. Social interaction, collaboration, learning from each other, learning in groups rather than as individuals, which we know is a powerful way to learn, but we also learn, very importantly, as Vygotsky, the great Russian educational psychologist, wrote in the 20s, in Mind and Society, he talks about the zone of proximal development, that we learn from each other and learning from peers and from expert others is extremely, is crucial to our, our learning in general. The notion of being active as well, that you, the need to be active, that there's activity. Um, multimodality, the different senses involved. Um, even in this exhibition, we thought about uh, things like, um, uh, you know, the handling, touching, the visual design of the space. We're in a very beautiful building this evening. It makes it very nice to be here to present and to, to talk and discuss technology and, and to meet. Um, and in Reggio Emilia, which is one of the most inspirational, I think, approaches to education internationally, the, the city in Italy, they call the learning environment the third teacher. So actually the space in which learning happens is so important. The actual physical um, aesthetic of the, of the environment, the ethos or the, as, as, uh, the context of learning um, is very important. Engagement. Computing, then, or the technology being used to augment interaction. So it's not the, the most important thing. It's, it's, and again, if it's, it's only in, incorporated or integrated if it adds value. And then the notion of pedagogy. But I think for your own purposes, you're probably looking at androgogy or adult learning. But equally, if it is digital humanities with younger learners, it's pedagogy. It's their learning there um, and learning with, with, for young people. So some of the things we did, we, we tried out technologies with users. We got feedback. This is a head-mounted display. This was early. As you can see, it's a long time ago. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, the, 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 the head-mounted display here, just as a way of interacting with museum objects, um, was, it, was it an effective way to, uh, you know, using virtual reality? And then looking at hybrid ways of combining things like radio frequency tags, RFID tags. You'll, get, you'll see these on CDs when you go into a shop. They're on, the, on a CD. They're used as a security device and other, for, for other purposes as well. So the, adding these to objects, could you then interact with a physical object, turning it by putting a tag on it, tagging an object? Um, and looking at what, what the museum currently does, a uh, very significant innovation that the Hunt Museum did a number of years ago was to put objects in drawers. So you open a drawer, and there's something quite magical about that, curiosity-provoking. You know, if you see a drawer, I, even earlier I was here looking at this beautiful cabinet and there was a drawer kind of open and I was really tempted to open it. So that kind of notion, again, of, draw, of engaging the user, the learner. Uh, looking at, you know, what already the museum did really well. Uh, the Hunt Museum, for example, they did um, these interactive kind of archaeological uh, st digs and things for children. They reenacted the past. 
And then starting to put together, you know, looking at alternative ways of making digital information uh, interactive. So it doesn't have to be a mouse and a keyboard. Can you interact with it by, by picking up an object and placing it somewhere? So when you're thinking about the digital humanities and how you might design, um, maybe it is, will be through more traditional a VLE or a MOOC or something that's you're going to interface with using traditional um, input-output devices such as a mouse and so forth. But could it be a Wii? Could it be some other type of interaction? Will it be gesture? Will it be sound? Um, again, it, it, will it be a watch? You know, that's the, the vogue thing now, isn't it, to put technology in a watch? <laughs> we'll watch that one cl closely. Um, so, you know, things like tracking using uh, webcams, designing these kinds of interactions, um, and then starting to prototype a bit more. So one of the things, as I said, that the Hunts did really well was they, they designed, uh, they were very interested in objects in the, act, the actual being used. That's their kitchen. That's an actual or original Picasso. When he was trying to make money in Paris, he used to do menu cards for restaurants. I have a copy of that. That's the copy I have. But that's actually displayed. And behind John Hunt there then is an Etruscan vase with flowers in it. That's an actual Etruscan vase. So it's a priceless object. But they believed in these objects to be lived. And then we also interviewed people. This is a personal friend of John Hunt's as well. And he talks about touching and feeling objects and knowing these historical objects all, the, all of their lives, the Hunt, the Hunt family. So we put it together. We sketched out some scenarios. We used scenario-based design. And then this is what we produced, which is called Retracing the Past. I uh, have publications on this as well if people are interested to... Uh, I'll make these available to Toma and the more recent research as well in um, design research and teacher training. But um, so we, again, with objects, using replica objects, exploring the past through um, material interaction and then also using some digital. But the, what, the idea was we embedded the technology in the actual environment. Um, so it was a, a different way of interacting with technology um, than you might normally uh, be experienced. It didn't quite disappear completely. The initiative we were part of in the EU was called uh, the Disappearing Computer. So we actually had to kind of create false walls to hide the technology. So the technology doesn't quite disappear just yet, you know, but maybe in, with the nanotechnology, that's, that's where it's going to go ultimately. But um, I will finish there, folks. Just, I think that's the last. Uh, any readings or anything like that, um, I'll absolutely make available. So just thank you very much um, for, for listening this evening. I hope that was was uh, helpful and if there are any questions at all please we have a few minutes now so about five minutes I think until seven until the reception so uh, um, thank you very much indeed and for the invitation from Tom and Susan as well of course uh, to come here this evening thank you Thank you so much. Um, I don't want to keep us um, away from the champagne way too long, <laughs> but um, should we ask, have a couple of questions now and then we'll just continue during the reception. Any, any comments or questions that you would like to raise? I think one, yes, go ahead, Mate. Probably a stupid question, uh, just for basic understanding. So design-based, for, for, for this kind of name uh, or title, design-based research is the same like design research. So is it research into design or is it uh, re research in technology, uh, how to design a technology, or is it uh, specific like humanities or specific discipline, uh, history, and how to apply design there. So I, I was not sure about the kind of interpretation of this yes. title. Thank you so much. That's a really, really excellent question. And actually, it's one that's extremely hard to answer <laughs> um, because it's actually the nomenclature, the name, the naming of design research is currently changing. Or there are people who call it different things. So I stay with design-based research, and I see it as designing change in education in the broad sense. So it could be history, humanities, in uh, just finished uh, some PhD research with one of my students and looking at mobile learning and drama together in English teaching. So we were looking at English literature, Shakespeare and so forth, and combining drama and iPads essentially, uh, to, and iPad apps to, to kind of engage students with Shakespeare and poetry and, and literature. So it's, from my, my answer would be that it's designing technology sometimes, but uh, usually for me it means 
including technology, but it's the idea of designing change or innovation for learning in, across subjects. Some people would call it now educational design research. Um, so they're trying to broaden, but it's a really great question. And it does link very closely to Herbert Simon and to design science and, and design education as well. It's a really great question. And, and so it's about it's specifically for education or also just or for research as well? Or you concentrate on education? Or? I, I concentrate. My area is teacher education, so I'm very interested in designing technology and, and change in educational contexts. But some people would, would see it. They probably would like, like the word to be learning because learning is seen as a more encompassing term. Education has the connotation of schools. So people would see it as informal and, and, and uh, as well as uh, formal um, compulsory learning. Yeah. But I mean, you could have the same impacts or same uh, discussions or um, apply the same things for the research as well, right? So I can, uh, not for the education, but for when I'm doing absolutely. my research project. So. Definitely, absolutely you can. Okay. Yeah. It doesn't exactly, it's a very good point. You don't have to, but uh, by definition, design-based research would mean education or learning. But design of course, is a broader thing altogether. Yeah. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> yes. Um, one of the things that uh, at least Agiati and I were reacting very strongly to uh, was uh, the difficulty of merging theory and practice. Mm -hmm. um, it is wonderful to require or suggest three cycles of design, uh, <laughs> very very few projects can afford that. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the challenges that we will all have to face in not only now Daria Teach platform, but in general that we do all the time is how to implement something like this in a, in a situation where you don't have the means and the, the resources to do it. Mm -hmm. Having said that, in a meeting that we held right before this um, talk, we were talking about our user requirements and one of the things that we said, and this is, I'm trying to show how we are good, you know, how we are actually, <laughs> you know, bef before hearing this talk, we said, you know, we're doing, we have a work package on user requirements, we, we've done interviews, etc., etc., and we're, and then we said, oh, but we will really have to revisit this once we are in the middle of the, of the actual design of the platform, etc., so we will have to go back and, and, and kind of iterate once again to make sure that we're on the right track. So mm -hmm. I think there are ways that we'll try to do s some of that, but it's a question if that will be enough. Susan. Mm. Uh, you have to use the mic. So thanks very much for that, that talk. It was really provocative. Um, so one of my questions is you sound like maybe one of the, the, the part of the 5% who maybe finished a MOOC. Um, and obviously when, when you went through it, like I've, I've gone in, never finished, but, but I kind of go in and try to see, you know, what's interesting about this or, or how they function. But what would be some takeaways that you might have about the framework of the MOOC and maybe why people, so many people don't finish? Um, what could we learn from that in terms of their design? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Thank you, Susan. Um, that's a really good question, particularly about around MOOCs. I think, again, it's, it's trying to, uh, where we have maybe a limited number of people finishing them as it is uh, at the moment, there's a need to, to gather data on why, that, why that, that's happening. That would be an important thing, I think, an important takeaway is to try to uh, conduct. I think, Tommy, you make the point about not always being in a position to have cycles and iterations of design and I think, but the more we can involve users and an understanding of users from the start with their technology for learning and teaching, the better. Um, but I think, uh, crucially, we, we do need more data on why it is people don't maybe finish. But from my own experience, I think, um, it's offering uh, levels of engagement in a MOOC, I think. Like, for me, I was very keen to get some certification from it. You know, uh, maybe it's the old it's the teacher in me. You know, to have a, to get a, the piece of paper. But um, to, so, and it was something I, I was very interested in. It was on Shakespeare and uh, Shakespeare objects and Shakespeare's life. So I was very motivated. Um, so that probably I'm probably self-selected in that way into it. Um, but I think um, certainly, you know, offering people uh, opportunities to engage in mul multiple ways, I think, is important as well. Um, where, the, where they, they can complete certain amounts of it and, and have some reward. I think that's a very important part of learning anyway. 
um, particularly to build co- a learner's confidence so that they, uh, if they finish 20%, they're still maybe... Sometimes maybe there's the view that you have to finish the whole course, which mightn't be exactly what the learner is looking for. So those would be... Oh, I hope they're useful takeaways, Susan. You use the word reward. You use the word reward. Yes. And and that's kind of an an interesting word to Mm. use. And and a reward, I guess, could even be that you take a quiz and you get, you know, you got 80% or Mm -hmm. something. Like some things that show that the user's on the right track or accomplishing something, as you say, even if it isn't the, you know, the entire MOOC, the entire module, whatever it is. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's interesting, this micro-credentialing, which is this approach now to offer people credits, I think that uh, to be able to do that in a gradated way, maybe in a MOOC, is a way to to get that level of engagement that isn't there maybe yet. Yeah. Um, Yeah, this might go in a way bit different direction than giving credits. Um, I, I would like to, maybe you could expand on, on the relation between uh, formal and informal learning. If you're doing sort of uh, design cycles or iterations, uh, mm. that you might do that in a community or user, user engagement mm. in, in sort of an, a kind of uh, endless rolling process. Like we, we in a way, we, we do it with, you know, um, uh, ordinary taught courses. Mm-hmm. We do it all the time. We evaluate with the students. We bring it into the uh, sort of the teachers community to uh, say, is this what we want to do? Mm-hmm. And then we take it back again. These feedback. So mm-hmm. formal, informal. Yeah, I think we, we have a lot to learn in formal. I suppose uh, the distinction is I would make is on the basis usually compulsory education. So you know that and that yeah but it's exactly I know uh but certainly in in informal I think we have a lot to learn in from we can learn from both informal and formal learning and they can learn from each other but if you look at museums they've had to in many countries have had to re re re-envision what it is they do because they mightn't be publicly funded anymore and they've had to, to actually get visitors through it all they have to like the Deutsches Museum have had interactive since the 20s um, you know, the, so the, the idea of, of making learning interactive, I think that this is something that certainly in, in design um, that we maybe don't do terrifically well in compulsory or formal and uh, where it has to be a, a kind of a, a mandatory or compulsory part of, of, elective, of elective learning environments or, not, or informal because people will, it's more free choice. People can choose what they want to learn. And in the same way, I think with... When, we, when you design a MOOC or you think about one of the things that was really nice, you said it, Susan, in your, your question as well, was the idea of a quiz. So at the end of these modules in, in a MOOC, you know, you have a quiz or something where it's interactive or there's some form of interactivity with, with the learner. So it isn't just um, listening or learning, learning something um, without any interaction or with limited interaction. Hi, thank you very much for an inspiring lecture, for inspiring talk. Thank you. I, I wanted to um, ask a question which is maybe similar to the previous mm. one. So, um, first, one, one practical thing. When do you start with design-based research with your students? Are they only uh, PhD students or even some master students? Or, and, or uh, even yeah. earlier? Actually, Toma answered the question for me a while ago. Um, it's extremely difficult to do if you don't have facility of a PhD or a larger project really. You do need that time to do it to the, the level, to the nth degree as it were, <laughs> to sufficient no, and um, you, you do need, uh, it needs usually to be a, P, a doctoral type work. Not to say that you couldn't have a micro cycle um, in a shorter period of time, it, but ordinarily to gather substan- substantive data over time, it would need to be a longer project, yeah. At least so you, three years. Research. Yeah, you'd need three to four years, maybe five. Yeah, but um, Eilish Flanagan, who did a wonderful piece of work with me recently, just finished, uh, as I said, on mobile and, and drama together. Eilish did very intensive work with two schools over a period of three to four years, working with them every semester, trying, experimenting with drama, what we call ensemble in teaching and education, 
and mobile. And actually, initially, her, her work, she moved it into mobile then as, as the work evolved and developed. Um, and my second question, yes. closely related, closely related to this one, and very short, mm. of course. Um, <laughs> yes, is... Uh, <laughs> yes. Anyway, uh, is which, what would you say? I, mean, I know it is multidisciplinary research. It, it is yes. obvious, yeah. yeah. But if you would, uh, if you would be forced to, uh, how would you, um, how would you define the the basic set of disciplines? Which are basic disciplines for this kind of of, of research? Digital literacy is, I believe, something that is that is a given fact. That is, but what, what else? How would you define it? That's a great question. I've thought a bit about this. I would, I would call educational technology an empirical computer science. So there are obviously theoretical aspects to, to computer science. You know, you have the theories of computing and networks and, and that. But I would def define it as a practical social applied science, but empirical computer science. So computer science would be very important. Education. And I would say as well, I'm, I was formerly an English teacher, so I would say English. Narrative. <laughs> I think English literature, fiction, poetry, these are the things that really, and the humanities broadly. So I would say humanities, computer science, and education. So I think you're in a very exciting domain given that you're working in that intersection. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we will, please, Claire, don't do this to me. Uh, we will start the, the reception now and, of course, continue talking to um, Tony. Will you forgive me if I don't take your question? Yes, wonderful. Um, thank you very, very much. It thank was a pleasure so having you. Thank you, you so much yeah. for the invitation to speak. Thank you.